Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and I would want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people and uh, to pay my respects to the elders past and present. A profound mark of respect for Indigenous peoples who have been here since the beginning of recorded time. And I want to thank everyone here today for being here today, for actually coming out this morning and, and hearing what I have to say. And I want a special thank you to Fatih Mansouri uh, and the entire team at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalisation for hosting uh, this event this morning. And of course, all of your team, all of your researchers make an incredible contribution, in particular, given the increasingly volatile and complex global uh, environment. Um, the Institute's focus on issues of citizenship, diversity, inclusion and globalisation is invaluable to academic and public policy debates. So I think it's fitting that uh, we are gathered here today to discuss the challenge of the global refugee crisis, although Fatih doesn't like that word. It's going to come up a couple of times, I'm sorry. <laughs> Many of you here today are advocates. You're, you're part of organisations that have worked tirelessly to uphold the rights and dignity of refugees uh, and people seeking asylum for years, for decades. And in this speech, I will share with you some of my ideas about how we should, as a nation, as a responsible member of the international community, move forward. I suspect there will be a bit, maybe a lot, of anticipation around what I'm about to say. So I do want you to be part of it. Uh, because as a backbencher, uh, putting forward ideas, uh, being part, and of course Labor is in opposition, I actually need you to be part of it. I need all of you here your passion, your advocacy, to help make some of these ideas a reality. To take those ideas, develop them into policies which can one day be implemented in a future Labor government. It's a long journey, a long road, it's a long a hill to climb. But I cannot take it alone and I ask that we take this journey together. In my first speech to Parliament in 2016, I said that as a son of migrants who came to Australia from Egypt escaping a region engulfed by war, I appreciated the yearning for a life of peace, of security and of opportunity. And in both the 2016 and 2019 federal election campaigns and the best part of a decade before, I argued strongly for an increase in our refugee intake and an end to the cruelty of indefinite offshore detention. Cruel because of the government's failure to resettle refugees for six or more long years, even with New Zealand offering to, to take more in. After I was elected, my staff and I, we, well, we, we set about working and we helped many, many refugees and asylum seekers. They come to my office, electorate office in Coburg, desperation in their eyes, and we listen to their stories. Stories of pain, stories of struggle, and stories tinged with the faint hope for a better life, a life without persecution. So this work, making a difference to someone's life by listening, by writing a letter of support, by making representations on their behalf to the department or the relevant embassy or even directly to the minister, it's critically important. And when we do get a result, it has meant that we've done some good. Even a back, backbencher's office in opposition can do some good. But my team and I can only help on a relatively small scale, in the hundreds. So I also recognise the need to contribute to policy that could make a broader impact at the national level. That's why after the 2016 election, I got myself onto Labor's Immigration Policy Working Group to contribute to the policies that we eventually took to the 2019 election. And these were good policies that included a commitment to ending the cruelty of offshore detention, indefinite detention of refugees with a 90-day goal for processing and pursuing swift resettlement of refugees doubling Australia's refugee intake and, on top of that, adding another 5,000 places per year through a new community-sponsored refugee program, pledging $500 million to the UNHCR, establishing an independent children's advocate, and for refugees in our community, ending the three-year temporary protection visas, the TPVs, ending the five-year safe haven enterprise visas, the CHEVs, and ensuring that refugees who are found to be genuine refugees, have permanent protection and the right to family reunion so they can start building a life in Australia. And for asylum seekers still in our community, we committed to ending and abol abolishing the fast-track judicial process, which discriminates against people who arrive by boat, 
and we committed to restoring welfare funding that was cut by the government, the Status Re Resolution Support Services, the SRSS. And of course, you know from opposition uh, before the last election, 69 Labor MPs and six crossbenchers in the House of Representatives voted to pass the Medivac Bill. We have seen this law repealed just last week. Devastating too was obviously the election result on the 18th of May because our defeat meant that the refugee policies we would have implemented in a Labor government, which would have made a difference to tens of thousands of refugees and asylum seekers, would not become a reality. But there is still an opportunity to do that, to make a difference on an international scale. Next week, the first United Nations Global Refugee Forum will take place in Geneva, where member states will try to coordinate a response to the largest global refugee crisis since World War II. The forum is the result of the 2016 New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants, which saw all 193 UN member states agree that, and I quote, protecting those who are forced to flee and supporting the countries that shelter them are shared international responsibilities that must be borne more equitably and more predictably, end quote. The declaration tasks the UN with creating the comprehensive refugee response framework and developing a global compact on refugees. This global compact, although non-binding, represents a consensus from the member states that the scale of the crisis demands a coordinated response. Now, Maurice Payne, Australia's foreign minister, has not committed to attending, nor has the Morrison government made any public statement about what role Australia might play in these UN talks. This is unsurprising given Australia's approach to refugee policy, singularly focused on the domestic politics of refugees, while consistently sidestepping broader engagement with the global challenge. We are a successful migrant and multicultural nation with a history of welcoming refugees, yet our potential to contribute to a global solution remains unrealised. The UN Refugee Forum represents an opportunity for Australia to change this and lead the development and negotiation of a coordinated global agreement that processes and resettles hundreds of thousands of more refugees each year. Now, we bear witness today to population movements across the world at unprecedented levels and think we can avoid the cost and avoid the impacts. But no matter how insulated we believe we are from these forces, either by virtue of our geography or our current fortress mentality, the waves of future mass migration could well breach the gates. The sheer scale of the global humanitarian crisis no longer can be denied. According to the UNHCR Global Trends Report in 2018, there are over 70 million displaced people globally, and these include 41.3 million internally displaced, 3.5 million seeking asylum, 25.9 million re refugees. 1.4 million of these refugees are most vulnerable and considered in need of urgent resettlement in 2020. They are orphans in camps. They are stateless. They are the most in danger. They are the most desperate. When a voter in my electorate asks me about refugees, usually the focus is domestic policy. I answer them and then I pose a question of my own. How many of the world's 25.9 million refugees were resettled last year? They will usually guess two or maybe three million people. When I tell them it was just 92,400, they begin to comprehend the scale of the challenge. The queue is not moving anywhere fast, nor is it getting any smaller. With UNHCR facilities overwhelmed and minuscule global resettlement of refugees annually, there is very, very little in the way of a queue in the first place. Desperate asylum seekers with their lives at risk seek refugee status by using people smugglers to take them to safety. As such, they've been described as queue jumpers and perceived to be circumventing due process. The immensity of the global challenge and the ineffectiveness of responses, both in Australia and abroad, is clear to anyone who cares to examine the numbers. In 2018, Canada accepted 28,076 refugees, the world's highest contribution, followed by the United States with 22,900, and Australia third with 12,706. Meanwhile, some wealthy developed nations accepted as few as 34, 16, 22, 18 refugees for resettlement last year. There are dozens of wealthy or developed nations that resettle only a handful of refugees. However, I will note 
that these figures are slightly larger when you account for successful refugee applications made direct in country. So, for example, Canada accepted an additional 16,500, the US an additional 35,000, and Australia an additional 10,000. But even still, with these additions factored in, some wealthy developed countries' refugee intakes only increased from 20 to about 500 people. So as this queue barely moves, it is the developing nations, such as Pakistan with 1.4 million, Uganda with 1.2 million, Turkey with 3.7 million, Sudan with 1.1 million, and Iran, Lebanon and Bangladesh hosting almost 1 million people each with resources already stretched that host 84% of the world's refugees and displaced. We cannot hide from these facts. There is nowhere to hide. The UN Forum represents a consensus that nations cannot continue to respond reactively or in isolation. The sheer scale demands nations work together, yet Australia has been unable or unwilling to engage. It has been almost two decades since Tampa and the Howard government's response, which laid down the blueprint for zones of cruel, indefinite offshore detention, which persists to this day. Some argue that indefinite offshore detention has made us safer and insulated Australia from the broader global crisis. But this callous approach does not serve our national interests in addressing the global crisis, and it is unsustainable in the long term, because the so-called deterrent effect of indefinite offshore detention is not the primary reason people smuggling operations have reduced. The trade is reduced largely because of covert and overt anti-people smuggling operations, turnbacks and targeting of their financial transactions. We know this because of evidence from a former immigration department official who went public. People seeking asylum see the route to Australia is closed, not because of detention centres, but because boats, for the most part, are no longer reaching our shores. Those on the far right who argue we need the cruel detention centres to maintain deterrence are peddling a myth. Indefinite offshore detention only suspends our engagement with a growing global challenge. Instead of collaborating with other countries towards a best practice model, we have shifted responsibility, not really even to other nations, but somewhere out there, some nebulous elsewhere, anywhere but here. Our approach has failed globally and domestically. The conservative side of politics post-Tampa has created a domestic framework that positions asylum seekers and refugees as external threats to be feared. The refugees viewed as potential terrorist, welfare cheat, taker of our jobs, criminal and eroder of Australian values. When we were debating the Medivac bill in February, the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, said, and I quote, they may be a pedophile, they may be a rapist, they may be a murderer, and this bill would mean that we would just have to take them. This was and is obscene, obscene dog whistling and simply not true. While those on the right seen every refugee a potential terrorist, those on the far left seen every refugee a stricken moral angel, stretched between the figure of the victim and the victimizer, the dignity of the refugee's individuality and humanity has worn away. What is incontestable is that whether refugees are vilified by the far right or victimised by the far left, demonised or idealised, this polarised debate generates plenty of noise but no viable policies. Actually, we have seen some of the most important building blocks of our modern nation, immigration, refugee policy and multiculturalism, securitised and politicised. A toxic debate has corroded broadly held views that immigration, including of refugees, has benefited Australian social, economic and cultural life in countless ways. This diminishes the strength and security of our country in a fundamental way. We are losing the bipartisan commitment to the foundational story of migration to Australia, one of nation building with a pathway to citizenship at its heart. Ultimately, this corrosive debate around refugees and migrants has been normalised. It's normalised these views and it weakens our democracy and our social cohesion. Australia has become more polarised, less stable, less secure, because we cannot move past the toxicity to enact viable humane solutions or even successfully capitalise on the advantages that the cultural diversity of our migrant nation affords us. Labor has operated at times uncomfortably both within and outside of this framework, attempting to ameliorate some of the worst aspects, trying unsuccessfully to establish alternatives such as the Malaysia solution when in government and more recently from opposition chipping away at the periphery by passing the Medivac bill into law. Nonetheless, this framework endures.
The nation has not been able to reach beyond. But it is time we start, because the global refugee crisis is likely to worsen. Repressive and failed states, sectarianism, violent conflict, natural disasters, and the impacts of climate change, including increasing aridity, depleted drinking water supplies, and rising sea levels, will continue to drive new conflict over scarce resources <coughs> and population displacement. Climate change will surely impact our neighbours in the Pacific. Our current blinkered solutions do not address these impacts, and the numbers show that the global community is not prepared for future mass movements of po people either. So what can be done? The alternative must be to work towards a new international agreement. This is why I propose Australia lead the development and negotiations for an international refugee processing and resettlement agreement, what I call the Fair Share Agreement, with multiple countries agreeing to lift their ambition to resettle hundreds of thousands more refugees each year. A Fair Share Agreement would draw on the distinctly Australian value of egalitarianism. Each country's increased commitment to settling re refugees would be calculated fairly based on negotiated and agreed upon metrics and set data points. Now, these metrics would be negotiated as part of the agreement. They could include population, GDP per capita, geography, net migration numbers, strength of resettlement services and systems, and the relative historical refugee intake of the participating countries. A formula would, would produce each country's yearly refugee intake, and because each country would be doing their fair share, it would depoliticise the domestic decision-making around refugee policy that plagues Australia and other nations. There are dozens of wealthy, developed nations that because of tradition, of their monoculture, that don't have a high intake of refugees. Now, if they were to opt out of increasing their intake under the agreement, they would be required to make commensurate financial contributions to resettlement services. Why would these countries do this? Because they would be contributing to regional and global stability. Because by doing so, they would be investing in their own security and prosperity. In alleviating the burden on developing nations hosting refugees awaiting resettlement, we can reduce instability and the strain on already scarce resources. If nations work together, we can make the world more stable and more secure by fairly and safely resettling hundreds of thousands of refugees more each year, well beyond the 92,000 resettled in 2018. Coupled with the retention of anti people smuggling operations, a fair share agreement with multiple countries taking more refugees each year would see the queue finally move. The reality is establishing a robust global agreement will take considerable diplomatic effort over a lengthy time frame. The beginning of the journey is the first meeting of the newly created UN Global Refugee Forum next week. It will be an opportunity for member states to pledge financial and technical support, the first steps towards a future agreement. If only, if only the Australian government, the coalition government, would take a leading role. But alas, I suspect it may be up to, we may, we may have to wait for a future Labor government to start genuine diplomatic efforts. One that would ask Canada, France, the UK, other regional partners such as Malaysia and Indonesia to join as first steps towards an agreement. Building that momentum as countries sign on and begin to jointly approach other countries. Negotiations would no doubt entail intense diplomatic effort from a future Prime Minister and uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs. A future Labor government could also consider deploying former leaders with expertise in foreign affairs, Gareth Evans, Kim Beasley, maybe even make it bipartisan and include Alexander Downer if he's not too busy on Donald Trump's impeachment trial, or even <laughs> Julie Bishop. Special envoys that would work with and support the proposal for a special ambassador for refugees. Because if Australia wants other countries to commit to shared responsibilities, we must take the lead. Now, you all may well be wondering why I'm focused on an international agreement or something this ambitious. Why not first focus on resolving our domestic challenges? It's a fair question. I believe the times call for ambition. I believe our time needs ambition. And my answer on the domestic front is this. A successful international repro processing and resettlement agreement would actually be a viable alternative to Australia's current domestically focused approach. It would do a number of things. Remove the toxicity from the domestic debate. The answer, I firmly believe, to Australia's domestic challenges lie in engaging and coordinating with the international community. It would preempt the worsening global problem of population displacement and its severe impacts by increasing refugee intakes globally, creating a more stable region, which is, of course, 
also in our national interest. And it will create that new and expanded pathway for resettlement. In conjunction with the anti-people smuggling operations, it would be a more effective and humane approach in reducing the people smuggling trade. Over time, and it will take time, this international approach can replace elements of our inwardly focused policies. If an international agreement is successful in increasing the global refugee intake, then refugees will have a better, safer pathway to resettlement, an alternative to people smuggling channels. Not only will, will the questionable so-called deterrent effect of indefinite offshore detention not be required, if more refugees are being resettled safely, there will be fewer getting on boats and less utilisation of the turnbacks. Now, sceptics will question whether there is any hope of success. However, we only have to look back a generation to see how multilateral agreements actually worked. Under these agreements, 69,877 refugees from Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia were resettled in Australia between 1975 and 1982. Of these, approximately only 2,000 arrived in Australia by boat. The vast majority flew to Australia once their claims were processed through regional agreements in Asia. History does show us viable alternatives to our current policies. While the current coalition government won't, I believe that the Labor Party must draw on its internationalist DNA to provide alternatives and lead. Yeah. Labor has a, a long history of remarkable international vision and achievement. Prime Minister John Curtin's wartime leadership, Doc Evatt's role in founding the UN and the Human Rights Charter, Hawke and Keating protecting Antarctica, creating APEC, and former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans' instrumental role in the Cambodia peace plan. And in November, our new leader, Anthony Albanese, reaffirmed the centrality of this multilateralism and regional engagement as principles underpinning Labor foreign policy and national security. Australia is a better nation, a safer nation, when we embrace global leadership roles. My hope is that with political courage tethered to an interna internationalist vision, we embrace the task of leading a global effort that enhances our national security, moves us beyond debilitating domestic debates, and changes millions of lives for the better. When Labor Prime Minister Ben Chifley spoke about the light on the hill, bringing something better to the people, he wasn't just talking about us in Australia. He was talking about the betterment of all humanity, of all people. To quote him, not only here, but anywhere we may give a helping hand. My hope is that we can once again place our light on top of the hill. Thank you. Thank you.